The Dog, a short story by Ivan Turgenev. But if we can admit the possibility of the supernatural, the possibility of its intervention in real life, then allow me to inquire, what role is sound judgment bound to play after this? shouted Anton Stepanich, crossing his arms on his stomach. Anton Stepanich had held the rank of state councillor, had served in some wonderful department, and, as his speech was interlarded with pauses and was slow and uttered in a bass voice, he enjoyed universal respect. Not long before the date of our story, the good-for-nothing little order of St. Stanislas had been stuck on him, as those who envied him expressed it. That is perfectly just, remarked Skvorovich. No one will dispute that, added Kinarevich. I assent also, chimed in in falsetto, from a corner the master of the house, Mr. Finoplentov. But I, I must confess, cannot assent, because something supernatural has happened to me said a man of medium stature and middle age, with a protruding abdomen and a bald spot, who had been sitting silent before the stove up to that moment. The glances of all present in the room were turned upon him with curiosity and surprise, and silence reigned. This man was a landed proprietor of Kaluga, not wealthy, who had recently come to Petersburg. He had once served in the Hussars, had gambled away his property, resigned from the service, and settled down in the country. The recent agricultural changes had cut off his revenues, and he had betaken himself to the capital in search of a snug little position. He possessed no abilities, and had no influential connections, but he placed great reliance on the friendship of an old comrade in the service, who had suddenly, without rhyme or reason, become a person of importance, and whom he had once aided to administer a sound thrashing to a card sharper. Over and above that he counted upon his own luck, and it had not betrayed him. Several days later he obtained the post of inspector of government storehouses, a profitable, even honourable position which did not require extraordinary talents. The storehouses themselves existed only in contemplation, and no one even knew with certainty what they were to contain, but they had been devised as a measure of governmental economy. Anton Stepanich was the first to break the general silence. What, my dear sir, he began, do you seriously assert that something supernatural, I mean to say, incompatible with the laws of nature, has happened to you? I do, returned my dear sir, whose real name was Porfiry Kapitanich. Incompatible with the laws of nature, energetically repeated Anton Stepanich, who evidently liked that phrase. Precisely, yes, precisely the sort of thing you allude to. This is astonishing. What think you, gentlemen? Anton Stepanich endeavoured to impart to his features an ironical expression, but without result, or, to speak more accurately, the only result was to produce the effect that Mr. State Councillor smelt a bad odour. Will not you be so kind, my dear sir, he went on, addressing the landed proprietor from Kaluga, as to communicate to us the particulars of such a curious event? Why not? Certainly replied the landed proprietor, and moving forward to the middle of the room in an easy manner, he spoke as follows. I have, gentlemen, as you are probably aware, or as you may not be aware, a small estate in Koziol County. I formerly derived some profit from it, but now, of course, nothing but unpleasantness is to be anticipated. However, let us put politics aside. Well, sir, on that same estate I have a wee little manor a vegetable garden, as is proper, a tiny pond with little carp, and some sort of buildings, well, and a small wing for my own sinful body. I am a bachelor. So, sir, one day, about six years ago, I had returned home rather late. I had been playing cards at a neighbour's house, but I beg you to observe I was not tipsy, as the expression goes. I undressed, got into bed, and blew out the light. And just imagine, gentlemen, no sooner had I blown out the light than something began to rummage under my bed. Is it a rat, I thought. No, it was not a rat. It clawed and fidgeted and scratched itself. At last, it began to flap its ears. It was a dog. That was clear. But where had the dog come from? I keep none myself. Can some stray animal have run in, I thought. I called to my servant. 
His name is Filker. The man entered with a candle. What's this? says I. My good Filker, how lax thou art. A dog has intruded himself under my bed. What dog? says he. How should I know? says I. That's thy affair, not to allow thy master to be disturbed. My Filker bent down and began to pass the candle about under the bed. Why? says he. There's no dog here. I bent down also. In fact, there was no dog. Here was a marvel. I turned my eyes on Filka. He was smiling. Fool, said I to him. What art thou grinning about? When thou didst open the door, the dog probably took and sneaked out into the anteroom. But thou, Gaper, didst notice nothing, because thou art eternally asleep. Can it be that thou thinkest I am drunk? He attempted to reply, but I drove him out, curled myself up in a ring, and heard nothing more that night. But on the following night, just imagine, the same thing was repeated. No sooner had I blown out the light than it began to claw and flap its ears. Again I summoned Filker. Again he looked under the bed. Again nothing. I sent him away, blew out the light. Phew, damn it. There was the dog still. And a dog it certainly was. I could hear it breathing and rummaging in its hair with its teeth in search of fleas so plainly. Filka, says I, come hither without a light. He entered. Well now, says I, dost thou hear? I do, said he. I could not see him, but I felt that the fellow was quailing. What dost thou make of it, said I. What dost thou command me to make of it, Porfiry Kapitanich? Tis an instigation of the evil one. Thou art a lewd fellow. Hold thy tongue with thy instigation of the evil one. But the voices of both of us were like those of birds, and we were shaking as though in a fever, in the darkness. I lighted a candle. There was no dog and no noise whatever, only Filka and I as white as clay. And I must inform you, gentlemen, you can believe me or not, but from that night forth for the space of six weeks the same thing went on. At last I even got accustomed to it and took to extinguishing my light because I cannot sleep with a light. Let him fidget, I thought. It doesn't harm me. But I see that you do not belong to the cowardly squad, interrupted Anton Stepanich with a half-scornful, half-condescending laugh. The hussar is immediately perceptible. I should not be frightened at you in any case, said Porfiry Kapitanich, and for a moment he really did look like a hussar. But listen further. A neighbor came to me, the same one with whom I was in the habit of playing cards. He dined with me on what God had sent and lost fifty rubles to me for his visit. Night was drawing on. It was time for him to go but I had calculations of my own. Stop and spend the night with me, Vasily Vasilich. Tomorrow thou wilt win it back, God willing. My Vasily Vasilich pondered and pondered and stayed. I ordered a bed to be placed for him in my own chamber. Well, sir, we went to bed, smoked, chattered, chiefly about the feminine sex as is fitting in bachelor society, and laughed, as a matter of course. I look, Vasily Vasilich has put out his candle and has turned his back on me. That signifies schlafen sie wohl. I waited a little and extinguished my candle also, and imagine, before I had time to think to myself, what sort of performance will there be now? My dear little animal began to make a row, and that was not all. He crawled out from under the bed, walked across the room, clattering his claws on the floor, waggling his ears, and suddenly collided with a chair which stood by the side of Vasily Vasilich's bed. Porfiry Kapitonich, says Vasily Vasilich, and in such an indifferent voice, you know. I didn't know that thou hadst taken to keeping a dog. What sort of an animal is it? A setter. I have no dog, said I, and I never have had one. Thou hast not indeed, but what's this? What is this? said I. See here now. Light the candle and thou wilt find out for thyself. It isn't a dog? No. Vasily Vasilich turned over in bed. But thou art jesting, damn it. No, I'm not jesting. 
I hear him go scratch, scratch with a match, and that thing does not stop, but scratches its side. The flame flashed up, and basta! There was not a trace of a dog. Vasily Vasilich stared at me, and I stared at him. What sort of a trick is this? said he. Why? said I. This is such a trick that if thou wert to set Socrates himself on one side and Frederick the Great on the other, even they couldn't make head or tail of it. And thereupon I told him all in detail. Up jumped my Vasily Vasilich as though he had been singed. He couldn't get into his boots. Horses! he yelled. Horses! I began to argue with him, but in vain. He simply groaned. I won't stay, he shouted. Not a minute. Of course, after this thou art a doomed man. Horses. But I prevailed upon him. Only his bed was dragged out into another room, and nightlights were lighted everywhere. In the morning, at tea, he recovered his dignity. He began to give me advice. Thou shouldst try absenting thyself from the house for several days, Porfiry Kapitanich. He said, Perhaps that vile thing would leave thee. But I must tell you that he, that neighbour of mine, had a capacious mind. He worked his mother-in-law so famously, among other things, he palmed off a note of hand on her, which signifies that he chose the most vulnerable moment. She became like silk. She gave him a power of attorney over all her property. What more would you have? But that was a great affair, to twist his mother-in-law round his finger, wasn't it, hey? Judge for yourselves. But he went away from me somewhat discontented. I had punished him to the extent of another hundred roubles. He even swore at me. Thou art ungrateful, he said. Thou hast no feeling. But how was I to blame for that? Well, this is in parenthesis. But I took his suggestion under consideration. That same day I drove off to town and established myself in an inn with an acquaintance, an old man of the old ritualist sect. He was a worthy old man, although a trifle harsh, because of loneliness. His whole family were dead. Only he did not favour tobacco at all, and felt a great loathing for dogs. I believe, for example, that rather than admit a dog into the room, he would have rent himself in twain. For how is it possible, he said. There in my room, on the wall, the sovereign lady herself deigns to dwell, and shall a filthy dog thrust his accursed snout in there, that was ignorance, of course. However, this is my opinion. If any man has been vouchsafed wisdom, let him hold to it. But you are a great philosopher, I see, interrupted Anton Stepanich again, with the same laugh as before. This time, Porfiry Kapitanich even scowled. What sort of a philosopher I am no one knows, he said, as his moustache twitched in a surly manner. But I would gladly take you as a pupil. We all fairly bored our eyes into Anton Stepanich. Each one of us expected an arrogant retort, or at least a lightning glance. But Mr. State Councillor altered his smile from scorn to indifference, then yawned, dangled his foot, and that was all. So then I settled down at that old man's house. He assigned me a room for acquaintance's sake, not of the best. He himself lodged there also, behind a partition, and that was all I required. But what tortures I did undergo! The chamber was small, it was hot, stifling, and there were flies and such sticky ones. In the corner was a remarkably large case for images, with ancient, holy pictures. Their garments were dim and puffed out. The air was fairly infected with olive oil and some sort of a spice in addition. On the bedstead were two down beds. If you moved a pillow, out ran a cockroach from beneath it. I drank an incredible amount of tea, out of sheer tedium. It was simply horrible. I got into bed. It was impossible to sleep. And on the other side of the partition, my host was sighing and grunting and reciting his prayers. I heard him begin to snore, and very lightly and courteously, in old-fashioned style. I had long since extinguished my candle, only the shrine lamp was twinkling in front of the holy pictures, a hindrance, of course. So I took and rose up softly in my bare feet. I reached up to the lamp and blew it out. Nothing happened. Aha, uh -huh, I thought. This means that he won't make a fuss in the house of strangers. 
but no sooner had I lain down on the bed than the row began again. The thing clawed and scratched himself and flapped his ears. Well, just as I wanted him to. Good. I lay there and waited to see what would happen. I heard the old man wake up. Master, said he. Hey there, master. What's wanted, said I. Was it thou who didst put out the shrine lamp? And without awaiting my reply, he suddenly began to mumble. What's that? What's that? A dog? A dog? Ah, thou damned Nikonian. Wait a bit, old man, said I, before thou cursest, but it would be better for thee to come hither thyself. Things deserving of wonder are going on here, said I. The old man fussed about behind the partition and entered my room with a candle, a slender one of yellow wax, and I was amazed as I looked at him. He was all bristling, with shaggy ears and vicious eyes like those of a polecat. On his head was a small skull cap of white felt. His beard reached to his girdle and was white also, and he had on a waistcoat with brass buttons over his shirt and fur boots on his feet, and he disseminated an odour of juniper. In that condition he went up to the holy pictures, crossed himself thrice with two fingers lighted the shrine lamp, crossed himself again, and turning to me, merely grunted, Explain thyself! Thereupon, without the least delay, I communicated to him all the circumstances. The old man listened to all my explanations without uttering the smallest word. He simply kept shaking his head. Then he sat down on my bed, still maintaining silence. He scratched his breast, the back of his head, and other places, and still remained silent. Well, Feodor Ivanich, said I, what is thy opinion? Is this some sort of visitation of the evil one, thinkest thou? The old man stared at me. A pretty thing thou hast invented, a visitation of the evil one, forsooth. T'would be all right at thy house, thou tobacco user, but it is quite another thing here. Only consider how many holy things there are here, and thou must needs have a visitation of the devil. And if it isn't that, what is it? The old man relapsed into silence, scratched himself again, and at last he said, but in a dull sort of way, because his moustache kept crawling into his mouth, Go thou to the town of Bialef. There is only one man who can help thee, and that man dwells in Bialef. He is one of our people. If he takes a fancy to help thee, that's thy good luck. If he doesn't take a fancy, so it must remain. But how am I to find him? said I. We can give thee directions, said he. Only why dost thou call this a visitation of the devil? Tis a vision or a sign, but thou wilt not be able to comprehend it. Tis not within thy flight. And now lie down and sleep under Christ's protection, dear little father. I will fumigate with incense, and in the morning we will take counsel together. The morning is wiser than the evening, thou knowest. Well, sir, and we did take counsel together in the morning, only I came near choking to death with that same incense. And the old man instructed me after this wise, that when I had reached Bialef, I was to go to the public square, and in the second shop on the right inquire for a certain Prokhorich, and having found Prokhorich, I was to hand him a document. And the whole document consisted of a scrap of paper on which was written the following, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To Sergei Prokhorich Pervushin, trust this man, Fyodulli Ivanovich. And below, send some cabbages, for God's sake. I thanked the old man, and without further ado, ordered my tarantas to be harnessed, and set off for Bialef. For I argued in this way, admitting that my nocturnal visitor did not cause me much grief, Still, nevertheless, it was not quite decorous for a nobleman and an officer. What do you think about it? And did you really go to Bialef? whispered Mr. Finoplentov. I did, straight to Bialef. I went to the square and inquired in the second shop on the right for Prokhorich. Is there such a man? I asked. There is, I was told. And where does he live? On the Okar, beyond the vegetable gardens. In whose house? His own. I wended my way to the Okar, searched out his house, that is to say, not actually a house, 
but a downright hovel. I beheld a man in a patched blue overcoat and a tattered cap, of the petty burger class, judging by his appearance, standing with his back to me and digging in his cabbage garden. I went up to him. Are you such and such a one? said I. He turned round. And to tell you the truth, such piercing eyes I have never seen in all my life. But his whole face was no bigger than one's fist. His beard was wedge-shaped, and his lips were sunken. He was an aged man. I am he, he said. What do you want? Why, here, said I. This is what I want. And I placed the document in his hand. He gazed at me very intently and said, Please come into the house. I cannot read without my spectacles. Well, sir, he and I went into his kennel, actually a regular kennel, poor, bare, crooked. It barely held together. On the wall was a holy picture of ancient work, as black as a coal. Only the whites of the eyes were fairly burning in the faces of the holy people. He took some round iron spectacles from a small table, placed them on his nose, perused the writing, and through his spectacles again scrutinized me. You have need of me. I have, said I. That's the fact. Well, said he, if you have, then make your statement and I will listen. And just imagine. He sat down, and pulling a checked handkerchief from his pocket, he spread it out on his knees, and the handkerchief was full of holes, and gazed at me as solemnly as though he had been a senator or some minister or other, and did not ask me to sit down. And what was still more astonishing, I suddenly felt myself growing timid, so timid. Simply, my soul sank into my heels. He pierced me through and through with his eyes, and that's all there is to be said. But I recovered my self-possession and narrated to him my whole story. He remained silent for a while, shrank together, mowed with his lips, and then began to interrogate me, still as though he were a senator, so majestically and without haste. What is your name? he asked. How old are you? Who were your parents? Are you a bachelor or married? Then he began to mow with his lips again, frowned, thrust out his finger and said, Do reverence to the holy image of the honourable saints of Solovetsk, Zosim and Savati. I made a reverence to the earth and did not rise to my feet. Such awe and submission did I feel for that man that I believe I would have instantly done anything whatsoever he might have ordered me. I see that you are smiling, gentlemen, but I was in no mood for laughing then. By heaven I was not. Rise, sir, he said at last. It is possible to help you. This has not been sent to you by way of punishment, but as a warning. It signifies that you are being looked after. Someone is praying earnestly for you. Go now to the bazaar and buy yourself a bitch, which you must keep by you day and night, without ceasing. Your visions will cease, and your dog will prove necessary to you into the bargain. A flash of light seemed suddenly to illuminate me. How those words did please me! I made obeisance to Prokhorich and was on the point of departing, but remembered that it was impossible for me not to show him my gratitude. I drew a three-rouble note from my pocket, but he put aside my hand and said to me, Give it to our chapel or to the poor, for this service is gratis. Again I made him an obeisance, nearly to the girdle, and immediately marched off to the bazaar. And fancy, no sooner had I begun to approach the shops when, behold, a man in a frieze cloak advanced to meet me, and under his arm he carried a setter bitch, two months old, with light brown hair, a white muzzle, and white forepaws. Halt, said I to the man in the frieze cloak. What will you take for her? Two roubles in silver. Take three. The man was astonished and thought the gentleman had lost his mind. But I threw a banknote in his teeth, seized the bitch in my arms, and rushed to my tarantas. The coachman harnessed up the horses briskly, and that same evening I was at home. The dog sat on my lap during the whole journey and never uttered a sound. But I kept saying to her, Tresorushko, Tresorushko. I immediately gave her food and water, ordered straw to be brought, put her to bed, and dashed into bed myself. I blew out the light. Darkness reigned. 
Come now, begin, said I. Silence. Do begin, thou thus and so. Not a sound. It was laughable. I began to take courage. Come now, begin, thou thus and so, and t'other thing. But nothing happened. There was a complete lull. The only thing to be heard was the bitch breathing hard. Filka! I shouted. Filka! Come hither, stupid man! He entered. Dost thou hear the dog? No, master, said he. I don't hear anything, and began to laugh. And thou wilt not hear it again forever. Here's half a rouble for thee for vodka. Please let me kiss your hand, said the fool, and crawled to me in the dark. My joy was great, I can tell you. And was that the end of it all? asked Anton Stepanich, no longer ironically. The visions did cease, it is true, and there were no disturbances of any sort. But wait, that was not the end of the whole matter. My Tresorushko began to grow and turned out a cunning rogue. Thick-tailed, heavy, flop-eared, with drooping dewlaps, she was a regular take-advance, a thoroughgoing good setter. And moreover, she became greatly attached to me. Hunting is bad in our parts. Well, but as I had set up a dog, I had to supply myself with a gun also. I began to roam about the surrounding country with my tresor. Sometimes I would knock over a pear, my heavens, how she did course those hairs, and sometimes a quail or a duck. But the chief point was that tresor never, never strayed a step away from me. Wherever I went, there she went also. I even took her to the bath with me. Truly, one of our young gentlewomen undertook to eject me from her drawing-room on account of Tresor, but I raised such a row that I smashed some of her window-panes. Well, sir, one day, it happened in summer, and I must tell you that there was such a drought that no one could recall its like. The air was full of something which was neither smoke nor fog. There was an odour of burning and mist, and the sun was like a red-hot cannonball and the dust was such that one could not leave off sneezing. People went about with their mouths gaping open, just like crows. It bored me to sit at home constantly in complete undress, behind closed shutters, and by the way, the heat was beginning to moderate. And so, gentlemen, I set off afoot to the house of one of my neighbours. This neighbour of mine lived about a verst from me, and was really a benevolent lady. She was still young and blooming, and of the most attractive exterior, only she had a fickle disposition. But that is no detriment in the feminine sex, it even affords pleasure. So then I trudged to her porch, and that trip seemed very salt to me. Well, I thought, Nymphodora Semyonovna will regale me with bilberry water and other refreshments, and I had already grasped the door-handle when, suddenly, around the corner of the servant's cottage, there arose a trampling of feet, a squealing and shouting of small boys. I looked round. Oh, Lord, my God! Straight toward me was dashing a huge reddish beast, which at first sight I did not recognise as a dog. Its jaws were gaping, its eyes were bloodshot, its hair stood on end. Before I could take breath, the monster leaped upon the porch, elevated itself on its hind legs, and fell straight on my breast. What do you think of that situation? I was swooning with fright and could not lift my arms. I was completely stupefied. All I could see were the white tusks right at the end of my nose, the red tongue all swathed in foam. But at that moment, another dark body soared through the air in front of me like a ball. It was my darling Tresor coming to my rescue, and she went at that beast's throat like a leech. The beast rattled hoarsely in the throat, gnashed its teeth, staggered back. With one jerk I tore open the door and found myself in the anteroom. I stood there, beside myself with terror, threw my whole body against the lock, and listened to a desperate battle which was in progress on the porch. I began to shout, to call for help. Everyone in the house took alarm. Nymphodora Semyonovna ran up with hair unbraided. Voices clamoured in the courtyard, and suddenly there came a cry. Hold him! Hold him! Lock the gate! I opened the door, just a crack, and looked. The monster was no longer on the porch. P. 
People were rushing in disorder about the courtyard, flourishing their arms, picking up billets of wood from the ground, just as though they had gone mad. To the village! It has run to the village! shrieked shrilly, a peasant woman in a pointed coronet headdress of unusual dimensions, thrusting her head through a garret window. I emerged from the house. Where is Tresor? said I, and at that moment I caught sight of my saviour. She was walking away from the gate, limping, all bitten, and covered with blood. But what was it after all? I asked the people as they went circling round the courtyard like crazy folk. A mad dog, they answered me, belonging to the Count. It has been roving about here since yesterday. We had a neighbour, a Count. He had introduced some very dreadful dogs from overseas. My knees gave way beneath me. I hastened to the mirror and looked to see whether I had been bitten. No, God be thanked, nothing was visible, only naturally my face was all green, but Nymphadora Semyonovna was lying on the couch and clucking like a hen. And that was easily to be understood. In the first place, nerves. In the second place, sensibility. But she came to herself and asked me in a very languid way, was I alive? I told her that I was, and that Tresor was my saviour. Ah, said she, what nobility, and I suppose the mad dog smothered her. No, said I, it did not smother her, but it wounded her seriously. Ah, said she, in that case she must be shot this very moment. Nothing of the sort, said I, I won't agree to that. I shall try to cure her. In the meanwhile, Trezor began to scratch at the door. I started to open it for her. Ah! cried she. What are you doing? Why, she will bite us all dreadfully. Pardon me, said I. The poison does not take effect so soon. Ah! said she. How is that possible? Why, you have gone out of your mind. Nymphochka, said I. Calm thyself. Listen to reason. But all at once she began to scream. Go away, go away this instant with your disgusting dog. I will go, said I. Instantly, said she, this very second. Take thyself off, brigand, said she, and don't dare ever to show yourself in my sight again. Thou mightest go mad thyself. Very good, ma'am, said I. Only give me an equipage, for I am afraid to go home on foot now. She riveted her eyes on me. Give, give him a kalash, a carriage, a drozhki, whatever he wants, anything, for the sake of getting rid of him as quickly as possible. Ah, what eyes, A.K.H., what eyes he has. And with these words she flew out of the room, dealing a maid who was entering a box on the ear, and I heard her go off into another fit of hysterics. And you may believe me or not, gentlemen, but from that day forth I broke off all acquaintance with Nymphadora Semyonovna, and taking all things into mature consideration, I cannot but add that for that circumstance also I owe my friend Tresor a debt of gratitude until I lie down in my coffin. Well, sir, I ordered a calash to be harnessed, placed Tresor in it, and drove off home with her. At home I looked her over, washed her wounds, and thought to myself, I'll take her tomorrow, as soon as it is light, to the wizard in Ephrem County. Now this wizard was an old peasant, a wonderful man. He would whisper over water, but others say that he emitted serpent's venom on it, and give it to you to drink, and your malady would instantly disappear. By the way, I thought, I'll get myself bled in Ephremovo. Tis a good remedy for terror, only, of course, not from the arm, but from the bleeding vein. But where is that place? The bleeding vein, inquired Finoplentov with bashful curiosity. Don't you know? That spot on the fist close to the thumb on which one shakes snuff from the horn. Just here, see. Tis the very best place for bloodletting. Therefore judge for yourselves. From the arm it will be venal blood, while from this spot it is sparkling. The doctors don't know that and don't understand it. How should they? the sluggards, the dumb idiots. Blacksmiths chiefly make use of it, and what skilful fellows they are. They'll place their chisel on the spot, give it a whack with their hammer, and the deed is done. Well, sir, 
while I was meditating in this wise, it had grown entirely dark out of doors, and it was time to go to sleep. I lay down on my bed, and Tresor, of course, was there also. But whether it was because of my fright, or of the stifling heat, or because the fleas or my thoughts were bothersome, at any rate, I could not get to sleep. Such. Distress fell upon me as it is impossible to describe, and I kept drinking water, and opening the window, and thrumming the Kamarinskaya on the guitar with Italian variations. In vain. I felt impelled to leave the room, and that's all there was to it. At last I made up my mind. I took a pillow, a coverlet, and a sheet, and wended my way across the garden to the hay barn. Well, and there I settled myself. And there things were agreeable to me, gentlemen. The night was still, extremely still, only now and then a breeze as soft as a woman's hand would blow across my cheek, and it was very cool. The hay was fragrant as tea, the katydids were rasping in the apple trees. Then suddenly a quail would emit its call, and you would feel that he was taking his ease, the scamp sitting in the dew with his mate. And the sky was so magnificent, the stars were twinkling, and sometimes a little cloud, as white as wadding, would float past, and even it would hardly stir. At this point in the narrative, Skvorovich sneezed. Kinnerevich, who never lagged behind his comrade in anything, sneezed also. Anton Stepanich cast a glance of approbation at both. Well, sir, so I lay there, and still I could not get to sleep. A fit of meditation had seized upon me, and I pondered chiefly over the great marvel how that Prokhorich had rightly explained to me about the warning, and why such wonders should happen to me in particular. I was astonished, in fact, because I could not understand it at all, while Tresorushko whimpered as she curled herself up on the hay. Her wounds were paining her, and I'll tell you another thing that kept me from sleeping. You will hardly believe it. The moon. It stood right in front of me, so round and big and yellow and flat, and it seemed to me as though it were staring at me. By heaven it did, and so arrogantly, importunately. At last I stuck my tongue out at it. I really did. Come, I thought, what art thou so curious about? I turned away from it, but it crawled into my ear. It illuminated the back of my head and flooded me as though with rain. I opened my eyes. And what did I see? It made every blade of grass, every wretched little blade in the hay, the most insignificant spider's web, stand out distinctly. Well, look then, said I. There was no help for it. I propped my head on my hand and began to stare at it. But I could not keep it up. If you will believe it, my eyes began to stick out like a hare's and to open very wide indeed, just as though they did not know what sleep was like. I think I could have eaten up everything with those same eyes. The gate of the hay barn stood wide open. I could see for a distance of five versts out on the plain, and distinctly, not in the usual way on a moonlight night. So I gazed and gazed, and did not even wink. And suddenly it seemed to me as though something were waving about far, far away, exactly as though things were glimmering indistinctly before my eyes. Some time elapsed. Again a shadow leaped across my vision, a little nearer now, then again, still nearer. What is it? I thought. Can it be a hare? No, I thought. It is larger than a hare, and its gait is unlike that of a hare. I continued to look, and again the shadow showed itself, and it was moving now across the pasture land, and the pasture land was whitish from the moonlight, like a very large spot. It was plain that it was some sort of a wild beast, a fox or a wolf. My heart contracted within me. But what was I afraid of, after all? Aren't there plenty of wild animals running about the fields by night? But my curiosity was stronger than my fears. I rose up, opened my eyes very wide, and suddenly turned cold all over. I fairly froze rigid on the spot, as though I had been buried in ice up to my ears. And why? The Lord only knows. And I saw the shadow growing bigger and bigger, which meant that it was making straight for the hay barn. And then it became apparent to me that it really was a large, big-headed wild beast. 
It dashed onward like a whirlwind, like a bullet. Good heavens, what was it? Suddenly it stopped short, as though it scented something. Why, it was the mad dog I had encountered that day. Twas he, twas he, oh Lord. And I could not stir a finger, I could not shout. It ran to the gate, glared about with its eyes, emitted a howl, and dashed straight for me on the hay. But out of the hay, like a lion, sprang my tresor, and then the struggle began. The two clinched jaw to jaw and rolled over the ground in a ball. What took place further, I do not remember. All I do remember is that I flew head over heels across them, just as I was, into the garden, into the house, and into my own bedroom. I almost dived under the bed. There's no use in concealing the fact. And what leaps, what bounds I made in the garden. You would have taken me for the leading ballerina who dances before the Emperor Napoleon on the day of his angel. And even she couldn't have overtaken me. But when I had recovered myself a little, I immediately routed out the entire household. I ordered them all to arm themselves, and I myself took a sword and a revolver. I must confess that I had purchased that revolver after the emancipation, in case of need, you know, only I had hit upon such a beast of a peddler that out of three charges two inevitably missed fire. Well, sir, I took all this, and in this guise we sallied forth, in a regular horde, with staves and lanterns, and directed our footsteps toward the hay barn. We reached it and called. Nothing was to be heard. We entered the barn at last. And what did we see? My poor Tresorushko lay dead, with her throat slit, and that accursed beast had vanished without leaving a trace. Then, gentlemen, I began to bleat like a calf, and I will say it without shame. I fell down on the body of my twofold rescuer, so to speak, and kissed her head for a long time. And there I remained in that attitude until my old housekeeper, Praskovia, brought me to my senses. She also had run out at the uproar. Why do you grieve so over the dog, Porfiry Stepanich? said she. You will surely catch cold, which God forbid. I was very lightly clad. And if that dog lost her life in saving you, she ought to reckon it as a great favour. Although I did not agree with Praskovia, I went back to the house, and the mad dog was shot on the following day by a soldier from the garrison, and it must have been that that was the end appointed by fate to the dog, for the soldier fired a gun for the first time in his life, although he had a medal for service in the year twelve. So that is the supernatural occurrence which happened to me. The narrator ceased speaking and began to fill his pipe, but we all exchanged glances of surprise. But perhaps you lead a very upright life, began Mr. Finoplentoff, and so, by way of reward, but at that word he faltered, for he saw that Porfiry Kapitanich's cheeks were beginning to swell out and turn red, and his eyes too were beginning to pucker up. Evidently the man was on the point of breaking out. But admitting the possibility of the supernatural, the possibility of its interference in everyday life, so to speak, began Anton Stepanich, then what role after this must sound sense play? None of us found any answer, and as before we remained perplexed. 